Welcome to Days of Roar, a Detroit Tigers podcast brought to you by the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorash. I am here with Detroit Tigers beat writer Evan Petzold and special guest, our producer, Robin Chan. We're going to do an emergency pod because basically there's been emergency things happening to the Detroit Tigers the past two days. Evan, you had a chance to talk to some doctors about these injuries to the Tigers' two best players. I think that's a great place to start. Share with us what you found out. Yeah, well, I think we got to set the table first. And in the last 24 hours, the Tigers officially lost their two best players in the roster to the injured list. And those two players might not be back for quite a bit of time. Left-hander Eduardo Rodriguez, the ace of the pitching staff, suffered a ruptured pulley in his left index finger. And center fielder Riley Green, who we all know is a rising star and the future of the franchise, suffered a stress fracture in his left fibula. So the information and all the emotions are fresh coming from the Tigers. I was able to talk to a couple doctors to get some information on that. And Eduardo Rodriguez is on the 15-day injured list. He's going to miss more than 15 days. Riley Green, he's on the 10-day injured list. He's going to miss more than 10 days. The Tigers aren't ready to speculate about the severity of the injuries. They're not ready to speculate about the timetable for return. A.J. Hinch says he's not a doctor. I'm not a doctor either. Mark, you're not a doctor. We I'm don't a want Google to play. doctor. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to play WebMD doctor. So that's why we reached out to a couple doctors to try to get some, some information, right, as to what does the rehab process look like? When should we expect these guys to get back? And so I was able to reach out to two doctors, both orthopedic surgeons at the Cedar sinai Curlin job Institute in Los Angeles. And they were able to share some insight as to kind of what this means and what this looks like for the Tigers moving forward. So the first doctor that I talked to was Dr. David Hay, a hand surgery consultant for the Anaheim Ducks in the NHL. And he was able to discuss Rodriguez's injury. And then Dr. Clint Sope, an orthopedic consultant for the LA Galaxy in the MLS, uh, was able to talk about Green's injury. And just to kind of set the table for what this means, um, based on what both of those doctors had said, Rodriguez could miss between 8 to 12 weeks before returning to the Tigers, which would be late June to late August. And Green could miss approximately six weeks before rejoining the Tigers, which is mid-July. Now, there are some things we need to talk about within that. But Mark, when you hear that, 8 to 12 weeks for Eduardo Rodriguez, approximately six weeks for Riley Green, what, what are your takeaways? Well, I think I have a couple takeaways. If if it's going to be 12 weeks and it puts you close to the 1st of September, uh, if the team's not competing for something of substance, it seems kind of foolish why he'd pitch at all after that point in time, um, unless he absolutely insists on it. But coming into an opt-out year, and it'll have huge bearing on his opt-out, seems kind of strange why he'd want to throw with four weeks left in the season and nothing to really throw for a B when it comes to Riley, you know, if this is a six week thing and it seems pretty normal for a stress fracture. A lot of hoopers get this type of injury. They get it both in their shin and in their feet. They seem to come back pretty well from it. I would, you know, he could also DH a little bit, get, you know, some, load off of it where he didn't have to play center field every day. So, you know, that that seems like a reasonable timeline. What it means from a baseball sense, honestly, it's a disaster. You have uh, by far and away your best pitcher. You don't really have anybody to replace him. To expect either Manning or Scooble to step in and replace Erod is, you know, a lot of wishful thinking. And they have no hitter on their roster, even remotely – equipped to hit the way Riley Green hit for the month of May and what he's been bringing to the table. You're talking 370 batting average, 440 OPS, 1.5 war for the month of May. They they got nobody on the roster that's going to do that. It does beg to tell you, though, that Spencer Torkelson and Javi Baez are going to really have to step up. What's your thought about it? No, I mean, yeah, you got to have guys that are going to step up two guys that you, you pinpointed. I mean, that's that's exactly it. Spencer Torkelson and, and Javier Baez, can those guys carry the load that Riley Green carried for, for pretty much all of May? Um, I think that's going to be the big question there. As far as the rotation goes, you're just begging for when Tarek Skubal and Matt Manning can be activated. We'll get more into that in a little bit, but I do want to go to the Eduardo Rodriguez injury 
and take you through some things that I was able to learn about it and just kind of walk you through you know, what happened and then also what Dr. David Hay, the hand surgery consultant for the Anaheim Ducks, had to say about the situation. Um, with, a, with Eduardo, it was a ruptured A4 pulley in his left index finger. And so what you need to know about the pulleys, and this is based on some research that I've done as well as the conversations that I had with Dr. Hay, is there are five pulleys in an individual finger. They are located, and the A4 is located between the top two knuckles. The A1 pulley is closest to the palm, and the A5 pulley is closest to the fingertip. And now the injury occurs and there's so much force, you know, created at the tip of the finger. And it's basically, you know, in most cases, an instantaneous thing. Now, this is very common in rock climbers. It is very rare in baseball players. This, this, is, this does not happen often. So this is not something that's, you know, out there a ton when you're looking at, at, at pitcher injuries. It's not like Tommy John surgery. Everybody knows about that injury, you know, with your ulnar collateral ligament. Um, but this, this is super rare in baseball players. So I'm going to send it over to Dr. David Hay just to give us a little bit more information about what this injury is and what the timeline looks back like for a return. The injury is a little bit complicated to understand. So you've got these two tendons that run up the finger. And so one goes all the way to the tip of the finger and bends you at the tip of the finger. And when you pull that tendon, you can curl the whole finger down like into what we call like a hook fist where the knuckles are straight, but all the finger joints are bent. And then there's a second tendon that stops at the middle joint of the finger and only bends you at the middle joint. So like, you know, like if you have all your fingers straight and then you just bend your middle finger at the middle knuckle and the top knuckles loose. So the bones where the fingernails are, right? The distal phalanx, then the DIP joint is that last knuckle on the hand, right? And then the PIP joint is the middle knuckle. And so you have the distal phalanx where the nail is, the middle phalanx, in between the DIP and the PIP, the proximal phalanx where the finger meets the hand. One tendon attaches on the distal phalanx, one tendon attaches on the middle phalanx, and together those help bend the fingers. Then there's tunnels through which the tendons pass. So the injury occurs when so much force is created at the tip of the finger. You're curling the finger so much into that hook fist where the DIP joint and the PIP joint are maximally flexed and then the the main knuckles are sort of a little bit flexed, you create so much force that the tension in the rope, the tendon, then tears away through the tunnel that is trying to keep it against the finger. So the whole thing here is it's not the tendon itself isn't injured, but so much force occurred in the tendon that the tendon sort of ripped through the sheath of the tendon or the tunnel that the tendon's in is, tends to be the best way to explain it. It's not injuring of the tendon as much as he created so much force to flex the digit that the tendon sort of tore through the tunnel that guides the tendon, which is the pulley. The tunnel exists through the whole finger, but there are specifically thickened aspects that we then name the pulleys. If you think of like a fishing line, the eyelets in a fishing line, and imagine if those were pulleys, that's why they're called pulleys because of sort of the mechanical idea of if you had like a rope going through like four pulleys on a crane or something. Trying to wrap your mind around the injury mechanism of that tendon pulling. It's the idea of like if you and I are pulling on a rope and we pull super hard and then a little kid can pull in the middle of the rope, right? And it will sag the rope, right? It's very difficult for us to create enough force in the rope to keep it totally taut. That problem becomes the case here when there's so much force in that rope that it rips through those pulleys. Then every time you do any force, you're stressing that pulley that you ripped through and has tried to heal. So it tends to be something where you're pretty hard focused, serious rest for a couple of weeks, taping it, trying to get some gentle motion going. It's pretty unpredictable depending on exactly how how bad the injury is, and then how it's healing and how the patient is feeling. You're looking at at least a couple weeks of rest and then probably taping it for another two to four weeks. And then now somewhere between six and eight weeks, you're doing some type of, you know, light toss. And then from my understanding, the average return on this small handful of baseball players is sort of a 10 week mark. So it's kind of somewhere between eight and 12 weeks where you're ramping up the throwing to where you feel like you can really throw but it's probably three months plus until you feel like you're past it. 
but it varies quite a bit. The timeline's quite variable depending on exactly how bad the injury is. If it was only A4 and you let it heal and you progress through, you're looking at the return sometime between 8 and 12 weeks, the average being kind of 10 weeks from the couple pitchers who've had it, and you'd expect in the longest term that he'd basically be okay, but this is an injury that you know has a long course of recovery. And So yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it is – eight to 12 weeks before Rodriguez is going to be able to return to the Tigers. And but one, one thing to know too is, you know, if there are more than one, you know, pulley that's ruptured, again, like I said, there are five pulleys in the finger. It's the A4 pulley for Rodriguez. You know, if there's another pulley that is that has been ruptured, um, specifically the A2 pulley, that could be a career-altering, you know, type of injury. And so, Obviously, he's going to go through more medical testing, but it seems like for now, it's just the A4 pulley, which is a good sign when you think big picture. And and yeah, I mean, look, they're going to need him. I mean, th- this guy has been as good as it gets for the Tigers all season long. You want to talk about season numbers. You want to talk about, you know, his last, you know, bunch of starts. I mean, he, he's been great. A 2-1-3 ERA, 16 walks, 67 strikeouts, and 67 and two-thirds innings. And then you want to walk it back and you want to take a peek at what he's been able to do over his last nine starts. He's made 11 starts this season over his last nine, a 140 ERA. I mean, this guy has been electric. He has been elite. Um, he has been the ace that the Tigers were dreaming on when they signed him to a five-year, $77 million contract back in November, 2021. Obviously for Eduardo's sake, you hope that it's nothing more then, um, you know, you hope it's nothing more than a couple starts, to be honest, but it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. It seems like it's going to be, you know, more like, again, eight to 12 weeks. You just really hope that it's not career altering. And um, hopefully he's going to be able to get back at some point, hopefully, you know, closer to eight weeks as opposed to 12 weeks. I I think, though, with Eduardo, Mark, there are serious implications when it comes to his stock at the trade deadline, because the trade deadline is August 1st. He has an opt out. The Tigers are going to want to try to get something for him, of course. But if he's not pitching and there's not a ton of clarity as to when he's going to be able to pitch, what team is going to want him on their roster knowing that if there's another injury or if there's a setback or for some reason he's not able to, you know, make it to the offseason healthy, it's probably not worth testing the waters in that case. You might be looking at at, at a short-term deal if you go to the the offseason injured. So there's a lot of risk involved both for the Tigers and for other teams. How do you see that playing out with the trade deadline on August 1st? Well, I think that we're still speculating on the true severity For sure. level of the injury and when he actually may be able to return. But based upon what the general thoughts are medically, if you know the 8 to 12-week timeline is accurate, and you'd like to hope it's shorter, but more likely than not, it's accurate. I would say that eliminates any possibility whatsoever that you're going to deal at Marto Rodriguez at the trade deadline. What, you know, you have a twofold question. First of all, why would you take a monstrously discounted value for him? A, and who's really going to offer very much, if anything, for a guy they're not sure is going to pitch and you don't know how he's going to pitch after sitting out for two months? You know, it, but what it does do is something else that's kind of interesting is, you know, you can't approach him and try to discuss. Now, if he's healthy and you're going into the off season, he can still opt out. Sure. You get nothing. Right. You get nothing for him. And I'm sure at that point in time, based upon medicals, other teams are going to be more than happy to pony up and try to cut some type of deal. Is it going to be the kind of deal it would have been if he wouldn't have been hurt? Absolutely not. But what it may offer the Tigers the opportunity to do is also have that discussion with him. And we'll have to see what kind of discussion that's going to be. I mean, maybe there's a year extension, maybe there's a one-time bonus to up the AAV of the contract, but it seems like an injury that's kind of freakish it likely will heal it shouldn't have long-term implications but you know this is gonna this is gonna test scott harris because these are the kind of decisions a team president slash gm has to make and you can't always do everything on the cheap you know picking people up from waiver wires your top end players deserve to be paid so i'll be curious to see how the tigers approach this for sure 
Days of Roar will continue after this short break. And then with the Riley Green injury, that was another interesting situation where he left Tuesday's game in the third inning with lower leg discomfort, and it was in his left leg. And he reported the injury to the coaching staff in the first inning. Um, again, similar to Eduardo's situation, the Tigers you know, aren't going to give a timetable for when he's going to return yet. Riley is going to be seeking a second opinion about the stress fracture um, to hopefully provide some more clarity there. And, and yeah, it was a situation where it seemed like he was dealing with the injury for who knows how long. Um, after Tuesday's game, Zach Short had said that it was tough, especially considering um, that nobody knew that he was kind of dealing with it, right? So it wasn't something that happened at a particular moment or on a certain play. It was something that seems like it was lingering over time. Now, I haven't heard that out of Riley's mouth yet, but the Tigers haven't been able to pinpoint when it happened. Zach Short talked about it being something that, you know, it kind of happened in the past that he was playing through. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm going with as of now. And yeah, wasn't able to play, had to be pulled off the field. And this is a guy, we talked about Eduardo's numbers. Let's talk about Riley, Green, Riley Green's numbers. I mean, the guy's hitting 296 this season with five home runs, 21 walks and 64 strikeouts in 52 games. And he hit 365 with a 1.008. OPS in May. I mean, this guy was your offense. He was your entire offense. And when Riley Green goes, the Tigers go. And to learn a little bit more about what the injury is and, and what it's all about and you know the timeline for potentially returning, let's go to Dr. Clint Sope. So stress fractures are typically we see these in mostly runners and they're not like a, a regular fracture where a regular fracture, you get enough energy to the bone that it creates an acute crack in the bone and the and the bone typically will will snap in, in half. Stress fractures are different. Stress fractures are caused by a more like low degree of force, but a repetitive force. It's an overuse injury typically that can cause like almost like a micro fracture in the bone. And usually we'll see these in long distance runners, sometimes basketball players, occasionally baseball players, but they're pretty rare for a baseball player and a, and a stress fracture in, a, in the fibula is very rare. Usually these are seen in the leg more in the tibia because the tibia sees much greater stress than the fibula does. When you get an MRI, it'll show swelling in the bone and that swelling in the bone, it's not specific for a certain problem. So if, if somebody has like a, a bone bruise, like if they, if they hit their, their bone, you know, against a wall or, you know, against a, another player or, you know, they can get swelling in the bone just like other tissues swell. And that could actually look the same on an MRI as a stress fracture. Whether or not it's a stress fracture is my first question. And I think that makes a big difference because stress fractures typically take a while to recover from, just like they usually take a while to develop. They can take a while for that bone to basically heal and recover from this overloading, repetitive micro stress to the bone. But a bone bruise... Like if he did have acute stress to the bone that didn't cause a fracture, but it caused basically swelling in the bone or bone bruising, that can heal much quicker. It's kind of hard to know how long he's going to be out for. It could be a shorter amount of time if it's really a bone bruise. If it's a, it's a stress fracture, it could be more like six weeks. The good thing about stress fractures is usually they will heal on their own and it's rare that they need surgery. And the bad thing is it, it, they tend to be slower to heal. The more you typically unstress them, the quicker they heal. <laughs> typically, I'd say it's, it's probably around six weeks that it usually takes for a stress fracture to, to heal. The most important thing with a, with a true stress fracture is to decrease impact loading to the bone. So mainly running. Running is, is, the, is the main problem. People can usually do an exercise bike, even elliptical, swimming, lifting weights a lot of times is fine. So they can still rehab and work out to a fair degree, but it's mainly the repetitive loading of running that causes the majority of the problems. 
everybody's a little bit, everybody's different. Every stress fracture is different. And the best sign is pain. If they're having pain while running, you'd want to shut them down from running for probably at least a few weeks and then kind of gradually get them back. And if he's not having pain, you could continue to progress and advance him with activity and loading of that extremity. So yeah, once again, great information uh, from Dr. Klinsope on Riley Green's injury. I think what's fascinating is the fact that um, he needs a second opinion. And he's going to go get it checked out because it is, it is interesting. Like this doesn't really happen in baseball players very often, specifically with the stress fracture in the fibula. Now in the tibula, um, that's sometimes more common, but you know, for it to happen in the, the fibula is, is not as common. So It'll be interesting to see after he goes for a second opinion, whether it really is a stress fracture or whether it's just a bruised bone. Now, if it's a bruised bone, great. You know, Riley Green's going to be back in action, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks and that's, that's no big deal, but you know, missing six weeks, Mark, that's again, that, that's your offense, right? And to try to fill that void, you're going to need guys to step up. Spencer Torgelson talked about, you know, the Tigers having to find a way and Javier Baez talked about dealing with injuries since last year. And, they hope that he can get back soon, but they're going to keep fighting. They got to do more than fight. They got to produce, right? Well, it brings up a lot of questions. What are you going to do to replace the offense? And, you know, you're at a, an important point. Detroit's fought its way back in a terrible division to within uh, a couple of games of first place. They seem to find ways to win games, today not being an exception. Beat Texas today in, in a game that, You really had to grind out for 14 outs to get a win, but that you badly needed. They somehow found a way to do it. Jake Marisnik will be fine taking part of the time in center field, but let's explore what possibly can happen, or then we can dream a little bit about what we'd like to see happen. So I think the first thing we need to address is probably the first alternative is going to be Kerry Carpenter, assuming he shows he can perform a little bit in Toledo. Why don't we why don't you give us your your thoughts a little bit on what you think the agenda is for replacing Riley? Yeah, so obviously, like we said, the Tigers need increased production from Spencer Torkelson and Javier Baez in the middle of the order, especially if Zach McKinstry isn't going to be able to repeat the best month of his entire career, maybe his entire life, um, to be quite honest. So yeah, Kerry Carpenter's on a rehab assignment right now in AAA Toledo, coming back from a shoulder injury. Um, when he robbed a home run and, and slammed into the wall. And so he's getting his at-bats down there as a designated hitter. And um, we want to see the throwing continue to progress, of course, but he'll be the first guy to be able to come back and kind of join this this, this outfield mix again. Um, and that's kind of you know option one, right? Because he's got the power in the bat. He obviously plays outfield and he's a left-handed hitter, which those are all all good things. And those are good things that the Tigers need right now. And that's, that's the first guy to monitor. And really after that, like there, there aren't a ton of names. I mean, you could go to Parker Meadows if you wanted to, he's on the 40 man roster. Sometimes it pays to be on the 40 man, but I still think he's another injury away from really getting an opportunity. What really sucks is that the Tigers lost Matt Veerling as well. On the same day that Eduardo Rodriguez went to the injured list, Matt Veerling went to the injured list with low back soreness. And that's something that shouldn't keep him out for longer than 10 days. That's, that's the thought. So I've, Again, time will tell on that, but I've seen him in the clubhouse. I've talked to him. He sounds like he's going to be just fine and, and needs some needs some rest, but then after that, he'll be able to come back. That's a right-handed bat in your outfield, and because of his injury, the Tigers went out and they decided to pick up an outfielder, and the outfielder that they picked up is someone who A.J. Hinch knows very well and has a long history with. And so the Tigers go out and they make a trade, and they add Jake Marisnik in a trade with the Chicago White Sox. The Tigers activate Marisnik. And he actually started on Wednesday in center field. So Marisnik is kind of this placeholder for Veerling right now. And you're going to get Kerry Carpenter back at some point. But then after that, you're kind of just left scratching your head. Justin Henry Malloy played the outfield today for the first time in AAA Toledo. So that's something to monitor. Now, I don't think that that was just based on the injuries that have happened. I think that that has some to do with getting him defensive. I mean, the Braves did the same thing, right? Like that was happening at some point. Um, just because of you know what Jahan does at third base and the questions about him there. So maybe he could be a potential option at some point, but he would need to be added to the 40-man roster as well. So there aren't a ton of options you know, coming to, to help out Riley Green and, and kind of to save the day. The Tigers obviously would love to get Austin Meadows back. He's still on the injured list dealing with anxiety. 
Don't see him returning anytime soon. But it's 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 a really rough situation. How, how can you replace Riley Green? You can't. You can't. No, you can't. All right. All right. So here's the elephant in the room. We've talked a little bit about this between the two of us. We've debated it. So here here's my two cents. Look, Parker Meadows is an uh, an option. It's got to be an option. He's got to be an option because they don't have any other options to be t- between you and I. There's a pretty long history of guys scuffling at AAA and coming up to the major leagues and actually improving their performance as opposed to scuffling even more. And my kind of joke to you when we were discussing it before, as I said, who has more power, <laughs> Matt Vierling or Parker Meadows? Parker Meadows. Yeah, who's a better defender in center field? Parker Meadows, Matt Vierling. Parker Meadows. Who walks more? Parker Meadows. Yeah, who's faster? Parker Meadows. Yeah, pretty close there, but I think Parker Meadows may be I think so too. faster. So when we're having that discussion, and I say to you that, you know, Matt Vierling had a 54 WRC plus in the month of May, you know why I'm really not super sad that he's injured and not playing because, to be honest with you, he was more passenger than rower. So, you know, somebody's going to have to step up here. It's going to be unexpected. It isn't the ideal situation for Parker Meadows to be recalled. But I'm sure it's on their mind. As far as uh, Jay Hen playing outfield, I think one of the biggest reasons why Jay Hen's playing outfield is there's a guy who plays third base playing at Erie, mm-hmm. who's now hitting 329. I, you know, and I haven't looked at his main numbers, but they were even better than Riley Green's well, nine, numbers. Nine, nine and, homers on the season, 975 OPS. The guy's name is Colt Keith, and that's a guy who correct. can be a driver for you. You talk about passengers and drivers. That, that's a driver, Colt Keith. And that's someone who, if you really wanted to fix the offense and you really wanted to find an answer, Parker Meadows, Matt Beerling, we can have the discussion all day long. I, I don't really know that they're too dissimilar in terms of what they're going to be able to do, you know, kind of from the jump, right? I think Parker Meadows obviously has uh, a, a ton of more potential in the long term. But in terms of right now, helping in this moment, yeah, I think Colt Keith is probably the one guy that you could say, I'll take a shot on him. I'll, I'll bet on him. He's the one guy that I've been able to say, I'd bet on him um, because he's well, done nothing but hit. He's done nothing but rake. He's done nothing but produce. And he's coming. He's coming. Everywhere Cole Keith has played, he's raked. He raked last year. He raked in the AFL. He's now raking in the Eastern League to the, you know, to a point where he's either, he, he, he might be the best hitter in the Eastern League. He's also two years younger than the average age in the Eastern League. The bottom line is the Tigers need offense. The Tigers need it really badly now because their best offensive player just went on the DL for probably an extended period of time. So whether you want to play him at DH, whether you want to play him some at third base, don't really care where you play him. But, you know, drastic times require drastic decisions. How about some? How about, how about a calculated risk, Mark? That is a beautiful way to explain it. Because who brought up the words calculated risk at his introductory press conference but team president Scott Harris? It's a calculated so risk. Talk- I mean, it's, it's again, it's gutsy. It's a move, but that's a move that says, nope, nope, nope. We see an opportunity to win in the American League Central. We're going to go for it. Cole Keith, let's ride. Well, I mean, here's my conspiracy theory, and I usually – don't get this outlandish and you'll probably be mad at me that I bring this up, you know, with not a long time left in this emergency pod. But here's the deal. If you're going to pump the season by bringing in a bunch of fringe 4A guys to try to continue what has been a really interesting 16 and 11 run here in the month of May, it's going to be tough to sustain it. You just lost your best pitcher and you lost your best hitter. And you need to show A.J. Hinch you're going to try to win because if Scott Harris is basically going to say to A.J. Hinch, you got to roll with a bunch of 4A, AAA players on too bad, this is how we're rolling, without trying to improve the team, I got a feeling A.J. Hinch is not going to be real happy with that idea. And 
you know, I think at this point in time, I'd be doing everything I possibly could to keep AJ Hinch happy because I think a third season of, you know, basically being terrible by the All Star break is just not going to fly real well in the long term relationship between AJ Hinch and the Detroit Tigers. Well, I think we saw a positive sign, and we need to touch on this as well before we wrap up. But Reese Olson, 23 year old prospect, was promoted, and he's going to start Friday against the White Sox, taking Eduardo Rodriguez's spot in the rotation. And you talk about punting the season, bringing in AAA guys, you know, 4A players. I, I know how you feel about Reese Olsen. I know you're not the biggest Reese Olsen fan. I completely understand that. But at the same time, they didn't call Willie Peralta, right? They didn't, they didn't say, all right, we're just going to go to Tyler Alexander. No, they said, okay, we're going to bring up Reese Olsen. We're going to give him an opportunity. We're going to let him pitch and we're going to test him. We're going to test him. That's a calculated risk. You could have easily gone to Tyler Alexander, shuffled some things in your bullpen and, and, and tried to make shift it and, and patch it up. They didn't do that. They're bringing in a, a, a real starter a real prospect, regardless of what you think, Mark, and he's going to make his MLB debut. And the rotation right now is is pretty much in shambles. It's Reese Olsen, Michael Lorenzen, Matthew Boyd, Alex Fido, and Joey Wentz. And the Tigers, of course, are praying for uh, the returns of Tarek Skubal from a left elbow strain and Matt Manning from a right foot fracture. Both those guys should return from their injuries at some point in July. Tarek Skubal is about to go out on a rehab assignment. He's going to need, you know, probably four or five, six rehab starts, depending on how things go. He gets 30 days before he has to come back. Matt Manning, he is, um, you know, going to throw to live hitters on the upcoming road trip. And then hopefully he's going to be able to get out on a rehab assignment as well. So once you get both those guys back, you're going to be feeling a little bit better about the situation. But right now it, it doesn't look great for the rotation, but I still think that it's encouraging that they went to Reese Olsen as opposed to going to Mason Englert or Tyler Alexander or calling Willie Peralta. I uh, I like the fact they're giving people an opportunity. I'd like to hope that they'll provide the same opportunity to the best hitter in the Eastern League when they need offense really bad. So spot on. Um, and, and at the same time, I'm expecting you by you know some type of delivery to send over my blindfold and two Xanax to watch this on Friday night. I uh, I'm not I'm not really looking forward to it too much. So, I bet you he'll surprise. Uh, I think he might surprise you, Mark. I think he might surprise you. That The, the secondary yeah. stuff is real from Reese Olsen. The fastball, I mean, that thing's going to get pounded, but I wouldn't be surprised if they tell him, hey, 20% fastballs. Well, look, Fetter is great at sequencing hitters. Uh, so I'm going to cross my fingers, and I've already been surprised by Jordan Watkinstry and the kind of growth he's shown as a player and God knows Jack, Zach Short has just played his butt off. I mean, the play, the play today, diving to his left was such a huge play today as part of winning and Zach's done a lot of things to help them win. So not two of my least favorite players coming in the door who have earned my respect with what they've done on the field. So will Reese Olsen be next or will he fulfill my personal scouting report about him, we're going to find out. But uh, I think it's important that we address all these concerns. It's been a horrible two days. The question is, where we go from here? What do you think? I want to leave you with one last thing, and it's a quote from A.J. Hinch taken from today after both the injuries to Eduardo Rodriguez and Riley Green. A.J. Hinch said, quote, we're going to get tested. We have to find a way because it's sports and it's our job. We need to show up ready to win every day. That much, I believe our team will be able to handle. We don't have to like it. We don't like losing key parts of our team. But they're not going to play for the foreseeable future. So we have a choice to make. And I know these guys will make the right choice. End quote. So we'll see. Well, it's going to be interesting. The one thing that I like to tweet, and they've really proven they can do, they find a way. They somehow, the last month, against all odds, when you least can be, when you least believe it, they do find a way. They won 16 games. So all I can tell you is it's going to be really interesting for the next 30 days to see what happens. They play some tough teams. I'll be interested to see the moves, and hopefully they'll be aggressive. Just want to say, I'd like to uh, like to thank Robin for uh, sitting in today with us during the pod. Thanks to Ev for making time out of a really 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 busy day. Been talking to doctors and players all day. 
I'd like to thank our executive producer, Kirk Crawford, for letting us do an emergency pod, and Anjanette Delgado. And this is Mark Gorash for Evan Petzold. And I'd like to say, peace. Peace.